You learned a little bit? Yeah. Oh, huh. that's good. Yeah. I'm very excited to talk to today's guest. Um, this guy is one of my favorite people. He's smart, he's talented, he's an actor, he's an investor, he's a philanthropist. He's got a new movie out called Vengeance and some incredible work that he does to protect kids. Our next guest is Ashton Kutcher. <sighs> the crowd goes wild. <laughs> the audience is high. <sighs> hi, hi, hi. I started having these conversations with folks because my production company, Simpson Street, is named after the street that my mother grew up on. And that's very much my origin story. So I love talking to people about their once upon a time, their origin story, and I wanted to talk to more people that I love and respect and adore, like you, about your origin story um, and your once upon a time. So I'm gonna jump in by asking you um, your sexy alter ego name, some might call your porn name, which is the street you grew up on and the name, it's the name of your first pet and the street you grew up on. My alter ego slash porn name <laughs> would be um, Thumper Oakland. Oh my God, that's good. Was Thumper a bunny? Thumper was a, like a St. Bernard. I feel like Thumper fits the porn name. I mean. It's perfect. Tell me about Oakland. Was it Oakland Street, Oakland Road, Oak Oakland Place? Oakland Road, it's in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's about probably a quarter of a mile away, like seven blocks or so, away from the Quaker Oats factory. Oh, wow. So where all of your oatmeal was being manufactured. It, so it smelled, always smelled like either Captain Crunch or Quaker Oats at all times. It's like Willy Wonka. That's like a, a kid's dream. It was about seven blocks from our school that we walked to or rode our bike, bike to every day. There was like a little bike shop, another block the other way, and like a week old bakery. So it was like where oh. they took all the like, Hostess Twinkies and everything that was like like two days of, to expiration. We take soda cans and we go up to the little store at the end of the block and we turn in the cans and then we get like five cents per can on and like a, on back. a back. And take the money and just instantly go to the day old bakery and like just buy as much like crazy, horrible food for us as we could. And so when you, when you smell those smells today, like Hostess cupcakes and Captain Crunch, like does it immediately take you back home? Yeah, it's it's insane. It's like they they call Cedar Rapids like the city of five seasons, but we also called it the city of five smells because it always had like the like aroma in the air at all times. The instant you I open up like Captain Crunch or something like that, like I'm like okay, it's like it's just uh, it's just going home. It's home. Wow. What were um what were some of the other scents like the the cupcakes, the oatmeal? Can you think of anything else that comes to mind? I, I mowed lawns, like I mowed our lawn, the neighbor's lawn, two neighbors down lawn. And always there was, an entrepreneur, uh, industrious from the beginning, I see. No, always broke and being like, <laughs> how do I make any money to go down to the hostess? <laughs> to get more <laughs> cupcakes, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about the house itself, that first house on, on Oakland. Like, what did what did the house look like? Was it a, a like a sort of a ranch style house or did it have more than one floor? Two story house and there were three bedrooms and there was one bathroom in the whole house. And I shared a bedroom with my brother, uh, my twin brother, and then my sister had her own bedroom, my parents' bedroom. I oddly like, I remember the house less than the neighborhood because, mm. you know, my mom was like, a, you get up in the morning in the summers like it is now, and she's like, go outside and play. We could be anywhere on our block is what outside go outside and play meant. And we had a cut through, through our backyard to our neighbor's house through a gate. Love and it. this, it cut through this guy's house that was our neighbor. His name was Harry Billings. And he was an inventor, which was crazy. He was like eight, 75 years old when I was a kid, but he became my friend. And I used to go to his house and like watch the Johnny Carson show. And he was obsessed with the Johnny Carson show. He actually, when he was a kid, Duncan Toy Company sent out like all these leftover tinker toys that had been built and he took one of them and like created like a spool and spooled a bunch of string up and then um, came up with the design for a yo-yo. 
and they bought the patent for the yo-yo from my neighbor for like a hundred dollars when he was a little kid. And so that's how the yo-yo, the Duncan ended up creating the yo-yo was my neighbor. And he was- This can't be true. Where to God? Well, I mean, at least, at least that's what he told me. And I always believed him because he told me a lot of true facts. So what was it like to leave the street you grew up on? So after my parents got divorced, my mom decided she was gonna move uh, with my stepdad. And they actually moved to the town where my dad grew up, which was uh, an, another street I grew up on called Y Avenue. But mm. I wouldn't necessarily call it a street. So uh, we lived on a gravel mm. road um, out in the country. Our nearest neighbor was like, you know, a quarter mile away. It, it was an adjustment for me because was, to me, like even though Cedar Rapids is like, I think like 200,000 people moving to a place where you're in the middle of nowhere um, was this like, oh, okay. Well, and, that, and, that, and then I learned how to like, you know, work on a farm. I love that you said that another street I grew up on is, because I do think a lot of us grow up on more than one street. And like we, the way that each neighborhood influences our development is unique. I think there was like a, uh, an impression that being from the city meant you didn't really know what work was. Um, mm. My dad got laid off from his job and I, I, I spent the summer helping um, replace like a tin roof. It was like three weeks and like 105 degree temperature, like replacing this tin, tin roof. I mean, I remember my great uncle looked at me. He's like, what have you been doing? And I was like, oh, you know, I've been working hard. And he's like, you've never worked a hard day in your life. Mm. You remember it. You remember that moment. I still hold it every day. What's really interesting is like I learned about hard work when I moved out into the country because bailing hay all day is a, is a job that you don't want to do. Mm. Um, being on a roof and roofing all day is the job that I didn't want to do. And that sense shifted for me and made me appreciate that the things that I see as hard work now aren't actually hard work relative to the hard work that I, that, that, that I did then. The other thing I think I, I, I got that was different was you learn how to entertain yourself when you're by yourself. Sometimes that thing that's entertaining is just getting better at something. Mm. Um, and so I think I had a shift in my personal drive to get better at math or get better at, you know, science or get better at anything that I could do, engineering, anything I could do on my own. Wow, that's super interesting. But are you, were your siblings with you in that move? I, I always, I'm an only child, so the fact that you have a twin is like very strange and supernatural to me. Um, it's a totally foreign idea. Were your brother and sister with you out in Y or were you there on your own? Yeah, so my, my brother was moved with us, um, but there was, a, there was another interesting shift that happened around that time where my, my brother had a heart transplant um, oh. when we were like 13. And prior to that, he, he and I were like this, just sort of inseparable. Like I didn't go anywhere without my brother. Enmeshed. I didn't do anything without him. Yeah. It was just one person. Um, <laughs> and after his heart transplant and he was in the hospital for, you know, like a year, it shifted, um, because I started to find a personal independence, um, but also, um, I think he came out of it and decided to find a new identity for himself. And so even though we were there together, we weren't, we didn't, we weren't doing things together in the same way, whether it was, you know, go play football or do whatever it was like, there were things that he couldn't do at that time. Tell me about some of the other kind of elements on the street you grew up on and it can be Oakland or why, like, what was the music like? What were the, what were the foods like? Well, two things. One, we couldn't afford to go to a restaurant if we wanted to. If somebody graduated high school, we, we might go to Red Lobster, <laughs> like, you know, in the strip mall. Like that was, yeah. the, you know, like going to the mall was kind of like a big day. The food was the food that my mom cooked. It was whatever we could get on the table. And that might be a, you know, piece of toast with some cream and mushroom soup poured over it. 
or it might be, you know, a bowl of cereal, or it might be a bologna sandwich. And music-wise? A lot of country music, um, like Garth Brooks and Brooks and Dawn. And I, I saw Garth Brooks when I was like 13 years old. I had like a cowboy hat on, and I was like in the aisle. I'm like, oh my God, it's Garth Brooks. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> take my hat off and I pointed to him and I was like, you, you. And he took his hat off and he pointed to me. Aww. He was like, you. And I was like, whoa, Garth Brooks saw me. No, oh, yes. That's all anybody wants, right? Is to be seen, but to be seen by your hero. Yeah. And so, and here's the crazy thing. He and I have the exact same birthday. <gasps> and so on my birthday, like a couple of years ago, Mila, tracked down Garth Brooks nice. and we had a hamburger with Garth Brooks and I got to talk to the guy. I was like, what? This is crazy. Did you tell him what he gave you in that moment about that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I tell him every, like every year on our birthday, I was like, you saw me. I see you. Happy birthday. It was like every year. It's a crazy oh, thing now. Wow. Um, so, so country music was really big. But then when I was like 12, I really got into like Bell Biv DeVoe. Yes. And you did. Like yes. Millie Vanilli. And course. I really got into like Candyman. Yes. And then <laughs> my buddy got this like Oldsmobile with T tops and he got a giant subwoofer in it. Oh my goodness. And we were like, oh my gosh, we can cause so much havoc with this. So then we just started listening to this like crazy like house music that was like as long as it had bass tones in it. Oh God. And we would just crank it and drive around just like waking up the cornfields. Like what were you? <laughs> yeah. This is a really eclectic journey. Did you think of yourself as like a, a creative person? Like all, being drawn to all these different kinds of music, was that like a, a peek into this life you would have as an artist, as a, as a person who became other people for a living? I was just not afraid to like what I liked. Hmm, that's a statement. We had this kid that was in our school in Cedar Rapids who was like the captain of the football team, mm -hmm. but also like, amazing singer and very into theater. He did both. And it was wild because he kind of paved the way for everybody else to just do both. And then when I moved to this new town, I was the captain of the football team and I did both. What, why can't we do this and that? And what, and like, and why does cool have to be defined by what one person's into? Can't we just like what we like and be okay with that? One of the things that really strikes me about your story is the number of really important male role models that you had. You know, your neighbor who was an inventor, who to me feels so pivotal in your development because I know you to be, to have such an inventive, innovative mind. Or your great uncle who instilled in you the idea of hard work. Or this student who was like, we can do all things. It's really interesting that you've been kind of blessed, I think, with all these powerful male role models. I've been insanely lucky and, and I still have a, a, a ton of mentors that I lean on all the time and reach out to all the time. What was your dream? Did you dream about, I know you were doing it all, so was the dream to be a quarterback in the NFL or was the dream to be the star of a major comedy as you were? Was the dream to be a philanthropist? Like, what, what was the dream? Uh, I'll give like a, a pat answer. And the pat answer is, why do you have to pick? Mm -hmm. uh, and is that how you felt as a kid? Even as a kid, you were like, I, I don't want to pick. I want to do everything. Yeah, kind of a little bit. Like, I, I liked working on race cars. Like, I thought that was interesting. I love playing football. I love doing theater. At one point, I wanted to be a geneticist and become a. And that's why I went to school for biochemical engineering. And, but the, but there was a, a a point where I realized um, that I I absolutely loved acting. I got on stage and I got attention, mm. and that felt somebody saw incredibly you. 
oh, it was like, oh my God. Like they, they applauded and they laughed at what I was, uh, when I was trying to make people laugh. And like, it was like this sense. And, th and that, that was like, that was a moment where I, I was like, okay, I'm doing this. There's no version of not doing this. And, um, and then I also, we watched a lot of TV when I was a kid and I had a poster of Kirk Cameron. That was my, that was one of my first crushes. Mike Seaver was the yes. man. If I can get like, do what that, like, like that, that thing, that thing. When I got that 70s show, I was like, oh my God, like it's that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and do you feel like, um, I think it's so cool that you got cast as a Midwestern kid with Midwestern values. Like, did you feel like you're that Oakland, that you brought Oakland with you to work every day? When I read the script, it wasn't like I didn't, there, there wasn't a title on it. I just got like scene sides. Having read all three roles, I didn't know that it was in the 70s. <laughs> And then you saw the wardrobe also, and you were like, these are really big collars. <laughs> Here's the thing. This was exactly the way life mm. was for me. We were sitting in a basement in a circle. Maybe there was <laughs> things were being smoked. <laughs> to me, that was just growing up. It did. And, and when it dawned on me that like, oh, this is supposed to be in the seventies. I was like, wow, things haven't really changed that much. Like wow. you still have the, you know, dad that's always on you and kids are still looking for that rebellious freedom, that sense of identity and trying to figure out relationships. And it's like, it's all the same. The only thing that's changed is like the hair in the wardrobe. Like right. it, it was exactly the same, which is, I, I think is why the show worked. Once you started working in Hollywood, did you feel any friction between the kind of Midwestern values that you talk about and the culture of, of the business and, and the town? I mean, there was more, I, I, I was coming from New York. So I moved to New York. Oh, okay. I won, a, I won a, a contest and I won a trip to New York. And like I- Like an acting contest moved, or a, like a supermarket no, sweepstakes? I was going to college and this woman came up to me and she's like, have you ever thought about being a model? And I was like, what? Like, it's just like, God, I, but no, like, this is not like Fabio was like my version of like a male model. And I'm like, I'm not Fabio. So, and I was like, oh, I have thought about being an actor. And she's like, oh, modeling is a great way to get into acting. I was like, okay. And she's like, listen, there's a contest that is in the shopping mall wow. um, like next weekend. Why don't you call him? If you call him, I think you would do very well and you could win a trip to New York and I can introduce you, find, help you get introduced to like an acting agent or manager. Wow. And I win this trip to New York and I show up in New York with a pocket knife, my clothes, my Boy Scout duffel bag and sleeping bag and a hundred bucks. And I, I come in second place in the competition in New York to Josh Dumel. No. Y yes. But then I get I get an agent and I just I called my dad and I was like, I'm not coming home. Oh, I just got chills. He's like, get on a plane. You're crazy. This is a bad idea. And uh, about three years ago, my dad was like, I'm proud of you. Um, you made the right decision. And thanks for standing up to me. And it Ooh. was like a. <laughs> It was, it was, it was a very Ooh. wild ride. So I went from Y Avenue, all of a sudden now I'm on 36th to 9th when it was still Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was culture shock. I want you to tell me if you can, like take a minute. I just want you to tell me the first three or four sentences of you, the fairy tale of your life, if you were telling it, like once upon a time, and then give me three sentences. Once upon a time, a boy who didn't know it was born the luckiest person in the world. Mm. And he was so lucky that when he came into the world, they made two of them. And off he went on his journey. I love it. Oh, that's so good. So you're from the Midwest. I'm from the Bronx. 
we know that things are called different things in different places. So I want to just do a little comparison between what you call a thing and what I call a thing. So here's number one, right? Yeah. That's a pop. That is crazy. That's insane. I don't understand that. That is a soda. That's a soda. Pop. That's a pop. Pop is what we call somebody's grandfather. That's what a pop is. Oh, that's called Papa. This is a pop. <laughs> no, Papa, where I'm from, is a rapper who's deceased called Biggie Smalls. <laughs> oh, that's Biggie. Come on, we call him Biggie. <laughs> we can play this game forever. <laughs> okay, what's the next one? Those are pancakes. Oh, good. We agree on that. Some people call them like flap flapjacks or something like that, but that's no, good. Flapjacks, I've heard flapjacks, but we call them pan pancakes. Okay, I like that. See, we're more alike than we are different. <laughs> <Next>. <laughs> What's that called? That is called a remote. Oh, interesting. Growing up, it was the clicker. Oh, it's also the clicker. It could be the clicker too. My eight-year-old, when she was a little itty-bitty, called it a marote, so we call it a marote. But that has nothing to do with geography. Just... Marote's way better. I'm changing it to marote. Okay, this, this next one is going to be controversial, I'm sure. What are those things called? Well, it depends on how specific we're being. So they're oh, shoes. Geez. That's number one. Oh, but, then, okay. but, but they're also sneakers. Wow, I'm so impressed. I did not expect for this to be more common ground. Or... Oh, here we go. When I was a kid, we would have called them tennis shoes. That's the one I don't like. That's ridiculous. Why would you call a shoe that you wear for all different various activities a tennis shoe? I, I don't even think where, where we grew up, it was like tennis shoes. It was no. tennis shoe. Tenna. Tenna. Tennis yeah. shoes. Yeah. Okay, last one. What's that called? This is, that's a Subway. Yeah, I'll go with Subway. Or you could call it a club sandwich. Yeah, I actually, like in this moment, I'm actually like getting a little bit anxious. I don't know what my cousins would say I'm supposed to call that one. I feel like I've been away too long. I would say sandwich, but I think, uh, I think a Subway sandwich is probably right. But that's just because of Subway, the company. When you were a kid, you called that a club sandwich or a hero. A hero, I think. Not to be confused with hero, with the G-Y-R-O. I want to give you an opportunity to shout out any kind of businesses or companies that are in Iowa, close to Oakland, or why. I mean, there was a very important installation that was like five blocks away that was 7-Eleven. That was like, <laughs> that was, 7-Eleven was like. An institution. When you went to 7-Eleven, that was like, you got the big gulp. Like, that was like everything, that big gulp. I have to shout out High V Food Store because yes. High V was the deal. There was a little bike shop down the street called Car City, and that was where you went and you got like pegs for your bike. The big one, you know what the biggest one was? Give it to me. Dairy Queen. Oh wow! Dairy Queen. That Dairy everything. Queen. But man, you could get a Blizzard, or you could get like a like a like a like a banana float, peanut butter parfait. It was everything going to the Dairy Queen. <laughs> this season on Street You Grew Up On, we've been able to come up with some money to be able to help our guests support charities that are close to their heart. And you chose Thorn. So will you tell us a little bit about Thorn and what it means to you and, and the work that you do? Thorn builds software that fights the sexual exploitation of children so that every child can have an opportunity to just be a kid. Mm. and. I had the great fortune to have an amazing childhood where I just got to be this carefree kid. And a lot of kids don't have that opportunity, um, usually because it's someone that they know or someone that their family knows sexually abuses them. It is, it is way uglier than a lot of folks think. Um, and 72% of the transaction for uh, sex with children happens online. And we thought, about a decade ago, why don't we start building software to make it really hard for those transactions to take place? And so we identify um, child sexual abuse material on the internet, um, report it and remove it. And we help companies do that. We help law enforcement find kids that are being abused. We've identified about 28,000 kids so far. Um, and we keep going. It's amazing.
It's really such tremendous work. If you could go back to that kid on Oakland and, um, and give him one piece of advice, what would it be? I'd just say it's gonna be okay. Hmm. What do you think he would think about who you've become, this incredible actor, investor, philanthropist, dad, husband, person? He'd probably say, why didn't you play football? <laughs> And is there anything that you would bring back from you? Like if you could go back in time, is there anything that you'd want to bring into this present time? I mean, I took it mm. and I got it. And it's right, it's, you want me to show you? Yes, I don't know of if course. I can. What is it? So I got this, this, um, this right there. That wow. is the lamp that was hanging over our dining room table, like my entire childhood. And so every time we sat down for family dinner, that was the lamp that was like overhead. My parents uh, had it after we left the house and they gave it to me. And does your family sit under that light? That light is actually in our bathroom. Um, <laughs> not over our dinner, our, our dinner table. It's with you in your most intimate moments. <laughs> hey, hey, listen, every time you go, oh shit, you go, oh, oh shit. <laughs> Ashton, thank you so much. I loved having this conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Send my love to Mila. Bye, Carrie. Best of luck. Mwah. I'm so happy that you guys got to get to know Ashton a little bit more. I think he's such a tremendous human being. What an incredible life. Please make sure to check out his new film, Vengeance. And if you're interested in learning more about Thorne, we'll put all that information out here. And make sure you keep coming back. Like and subscribe. I'm so excited to share more streets for more people and hear more about their journeys growing up. So thank you, see you soon.